Can I? Amen. Tell you, Mrs. Jones is here. Their family's here, church planner. And she said she'd play the piano. And, of course, I said, no. No, nah, not on your life. Was well, that one going to happen? <laughs> we are so excited to have her. She's going to play. We're excited. Turn to page number 205. Page number 205. He keeps me singing. Let's all stand and sing. 205. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of my self and more. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife, this heart filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken tree, heard the suffering chords again. On the riches of his grace, resting neath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know, fills my every longing. Singing as I go, soon he's coming back to welcome me. Far beyond the starry sky, I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 greatest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Hey, man, turn to page number 377. Rescue the perishing. 377. Father, we thank you this morning for your blessings. We thank you for the beautiful day you've given us. 
Lord, as we come together, Lord, in this service to uh, worship you, Lord, I pray that you uh, help us, Lord, and through the Spirit of God to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would work in each and every heart of each and every individual that's here, uh, each and every one that's watching my live stream. Lord, that uh, the desires of your heart would be the desires of our heart. Father, I pray this morning, Lord, that uh, you'd be with those who are able to be here. There are some that are out ill. Uh, Lord, there are some that have been diagnosed with uh, uh, different various diseases, Lord, over the last week as well. Uh, Lord, for uh, those that are working, Lord, that you uh, watch over, protect, and help them, Lord, to be a witness uh, out there on the job. And then, Father, we pray uh, this morning, Lord, for uh, just a mighty outpouring of your spirit in the hearts and minds of your people. We'll give you the thanks. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Make a seat. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday AM services of our Grove Baptist Church. Hello to see everybody here today. Ah, looks like we're starting a whole new unit on Peter. This is Peter the Apostle of Christ. And like it says here in the, in the, the, uh, the bulletin, Peter's an impulsive guy. He's a loud mouth guy. He gets in trouble a lot of times. He's got kind of, kind of foot and mouth issues a lot of times. But however, when you see the life of Peter, God took him. Um, and having said that, what I'd like to do is we'd look at 1 Peter 5, 5, if you don't mind. We started this, we talked a little bit about it yesterday. We talked about the concept of pride, this love of yourself in my Sunday school class, uh, as a part of looking at, at the book of Esther. And so when you look at first, uh, 1 Peter 5, 5, what's going on is Peter is giving some instructions to the elders of the church, and then he switches and he starts giving some instructions to the younger people. Likewise, you know, submit yourselves unto the elders. Then he expands it. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. And so, what went through my heart, my, my mind, why is he resisting the, 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 the proud? Why, why does he have to do this? And the reason is, is that God can't do this in the of his life. You know, what he's got to do, he's got to go through a process of emptying you of yourself so that he can. So that he can use you. So yeah, just study the book of Peter for me. Absolutely wonderful. I'm looking, really good. Uh, looking at our announcements. Mark your calendar. Next Sunday is time changes. Please, please, everyone push your socks up. Who else wants to go have a please remember? You spring forward and you fall back, not the other way around. March 14th through the 18th is spring break. You know, we're all looking forward to that, at least. Especially the bearded ones among us. Uh, Sunday, March the 27th, is Easter Sunday. And please, if you can come, you know, all means come and if you can't bring something, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate the most important event in the history of the Catholic Church. Because that Sunday, everything pivots off that one, that one night. So, by all means, you know, come and celebrate ourselves with our friends and young ladies and give them a little bit of take a seat at the top of the night and see how we can make it inside. Sunday, the 8th, is Mother's Day. Um, looking at our school, basketball season's over here. We're starting a whole new unit here. Who, who's on track? Is your first track meet is Tuesday? Maybe Tuesday if it doesn't rain out. So you might want to be in prayer for some good weather for Steve and, and his kids. You've got to bear in mind, these kids do, do it all the time on track. They're doing everything from, from block to 880 all the way down to throwing the, the shot putt and, and the discus. So I just really, really look Um, as always, our Sunday school starts at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Our worship service is at 11 a.m. Our evening service is Sunday afternoons at 5 p.m. So it goes back from 6 to 5. And then our Wednesday evening services are at 7 p.m. Our Reformers Unanimous services are on Fridays at 7 p.m. on that evening. Uh, Wednesday is like we always talk about as family. If you're a visitor, we're, we're glad to have you. And as we always say, you're supposed to come as a visitor, as a part of us, as a friend, 
what we're going to ask you to do, if you didn't get one of these when you came in, you'll look at the, uh, the, the few in front of you. If you fill that out, put it in the offering plate as it goes by. We would love that. Again, thank you for being here. We know every inch of the All right, we have the privilege this morning of having uh, Brother Philip Jones. Uh, it's his, it is his wife who is playing the piano for us. Uh, they are church planners in uh, Pasadena, California, and uh, he's going to be with us. They're going to be with us all day today. Yeah, well, they'll be with us tonight if they don't get sick from my cooking. Uh, but <laughs> but anyway, it's good to have the boys. They, they were here yesterday. We went uh, out uh, soul winning or knocking, and uh, Luke and I got to lead a, a young lady to the Lord. And uh, uh, Noah and, and Levi went out and knocked doors, and they had some good prospects too. And uh, so, and uh, Brother Philip and his wife stayed home. I said, you sick? No, I, they came out and helped us, and uh, it was a real blessing to have them. I'm gonna let Brother uh, Philip come and just uh, share a little bit uh, about uh, uh, the work there. Uh, by the way, he comes highly recommended for the Jack Lamb. Uh, we helped su uh, support in West Covina, California. Uh, says uh, they're a worthy family, and if you uh, will take them on, you can take my support and give to them. So, uh, anyway, so you come on. Seem like we're around strangers and just very hospitable. And I, I thank you for that. I pastored in uh, in Atlanta, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, in Covington for uh, about uh, a little over eight years, uh, up until um, up until the end of March of 2015, uh, when we were signed and began our deputation. Uh, God spoke to my heart and, and called us to go to uh, Pasadena, California, and plant a church. Pasadena is a city of 150,000 people, and they have churches of all well, churches of all sorts and everything. They have no church that is preaching the truth of the word of God. They have all the cults. They have all the different, uh, you know, ear scratchers and so forth. But they have none that are telling, uh, but they're preaching thus saith the Lord. And uh, it's our desire to, uh, to go and to share the truth of the gospel with the folks there and to reach them uh, for Jesus Christ and to, and to see a church planted there. Uh, our the Lord has worked things out, so we're going to be moving to Pasadena. Weeks, uh, we're going to be moving there to California, and, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll start immediately uh, soul winning and uh, discipleship and things like that. And uh, Lord willing, we'll have our grand opening service in September of this year. So uh, you pray for us. We're excited about what the Lord is doing, and we look forward to sharing more uh, with you tonight and uh, see how the Lord is going to work. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this service this morning. I've heard, I've heard so much about the, about the, the church, and I uh, have uh, spoke to your pastor a few times. Fellowship with you yesterday. I'm looking forward to hearing your preaching this morning. Amen. And it's always good to hear your preaching from the Word of God. Amen. All right. Get us on back. Turn to page number 372. Page number 372. Let's all stand. Have some men come forward to see the offering on the last board. 372. Rightly be. Our Father's mercy from His light out evermore. But to us He gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the Lord lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor faith, these struggling seamen. You may rescue, you may save. Dark the night of sin has struggled, while the angry billows roar. Eager eyes are watching, longing for the light along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send the gleam across. 
Lord may save us, you may rescue, you may save. Trim your people and my brother, some poor sailor tempest falls, crying now to make the harbor in the darkness make it long. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor fading, struggling seaman, you may rescue you. Amen. As we uh, receive the offering this morning, just reminding you that uh, the Bible teaches that we are to give. Uh, it is a biblical principle. It's a godly principle. Uh, as we give, God blesses what we give. Uh, we don't believe that uh, if you give $1,000, God's going to bless you with $10,000. Now, he's able and capable of doing that. But there's a lot of churches that, that that's how they get people to give. You give, and God's going to bless you. But well, God is going to bless you because you're being obedient to him. The blessings come in, in a myriad of ways, not just in financial, uh, health, other areas. So just give. And the Bible teaches us very clearly uh, God loves a cheerful giver. We bow for prayer. Uh, Brother Jason, you lead us in prayer. Father, as we come before you this morning, we express our thank you for the Father's good for us, Father. Uh, being there for us and helping us uh, through the hard times, but also for being there through the good times, Father. We thank you for that. We thank you for this service, Father. We uh, ask you to bless it and that we thank you for the Holy Spirit, Father. Uh, we thank you for all that you do. We ask you to bless this offering. We ask you to use your good work and use it in our soul's life to save the lives of people, Father. We love you. Amen. Amen. To some it's just an emblem of formality. It's a symbol that's been used so frequently. Many blaspheme and despise, though it's ancient, it survives. The shrine to death that stands for life to me. There was a cross made for the Son of God at Calvary. Two pieces of rough timber on a hill. Through his hands and through his feet, he took the nails for you and me. Angels watched as he died for the Lord. He could have walked away, he chose the cross. 
You see why this old emblem is so dear to me. It stood for suffering and brought us peace. It bridged the gap for men, offered cleansing for our sins. An icon that reminds us that we're free. There was a cross made by the Son of God at Calvary. Two pieces of rough timber on a hill. Through his hands and through his feet, he took the nails for you and me. Angels watched as he died for the Lord. Though he could have walked away, he chose the cross. God forbid that I should ever let my memory fail, but forever keep the cross in view, for that's where I was saved. I was saved. There was a cross. Made for the Son of God at Calvary. Two pieces of rough timber on a hill. Through his hands and through his feet, he took the nails for you and me. Angels watched as he died for the Lord. Though he have walked away, he chose the cross. Though he could have walked away, he chose the cross. He chose the cross. Bibles, please. What have I done now? If you will take your Bibles, turn to First Peter chapter number one. First Peter chapter number one. Remind me at the end of the message I have an announcement I need to make, but I can't make it right now uh, because we're on live stream. <coughs> and you'll understand at the end of the message when I tell you what the announcement is. But don't forget to remind me. Uh, I had a note up here. I think somebody threw it away, just up laying up here to remind me. And I, so remind me, okay, when I start to say, okay, let's bow our heads and call on somebody to pray, and I'm walking from the pulpit, you're going to have to stop. Wait, 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 stop, 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 Pastor, you said you have an announcement. I do have an announcement. So <laughs> make sure I make it, okay? All right, it's very important, a very important announcement, okay? All right, First Peter chapter number 1, First Peter chapter number 1. Uh, what uh, Brother uh, uh, Philip doesn't realize is when you get old and gray-headed, you forget things a lot, okay? The gray matter and the gray hair get confused and uh, sends electrical impulses or false echoes or something. I don't know what it is, but it's been working that way since I was 16, so it's, you know, <laughs> and I didn't do any of those funny jokes, so <laughs> anyway. First Peter chapter number 1, uh, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. I invite you to stand with me in the, in the reverence of the reading of the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter number 1. If you're having a hard time finding uh, 1 Peter, it's in the Bible. <laughs> and it's, it's towards the end of the book. If you turn to Revelation and go backwards, Revelation, Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John, 2 Peter, 1 Peter, you'll find it. Right before 2 Peter, you will, or right after 2 Peter, you'll find it. Okay? If you're going from, from Genesis, it's going to take you a while. So we're not going to wait on you. All right. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Verse number 1 says, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. 
want to speak to you this morning on the subject, to the strangers scattered abroad. May we pray. Father, we thank you again this morning for your goodness and your mercy towards us. Lord, we uh, could not be here. We could not be assembled in this room, uh, Lord, if it were not for your mercy and for your grace. And even uh, as Peter addressed those in this epistle to those strangers that are scattered uh, throughout these areas, uh, Lord, he, he, he closes this, this, this section, this introduction, with grace and peace be multiplied. And Lord, without your grace, without your peace, uh, we have nothing. And Father, I just pray this morning that, again, that the Holy Spirit of God would nestle up against us, uh, help us to uh, understand uh, the truths of the Word of God. John uh, recorded under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 that the Holy Spirit was there to teach us and to guide us uh, into all truth. So Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would guide us this morning. Father, I pray that you give me a special anointing, a special uh, a fullness of the Spirit this morning to preach the Word uh, the way that you would have it preached, Lord, that you that I would uh, remove myself from uh, your job this morning. Father, I thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. As we've studied last week, we studied the, the life of Peter, and uh, we talked about the fact that Peter was a very impulsive young man, uh, and yet he was chosen by God. And as you look at the life of Peter, whether you're male or female, you could probably put yourself in some of the things that, that Peter has done. Impulsiveness. You say, what is impulsiveness? Uh, ladies, it's when you go to Walmart to pick up two things that come out with the store. That's impulsiveness, okay? All right, guys, stop laughing. It's going to Home Depot to pick up a latch for your fence and coming out with a whole store. That's impulsiveness. Am I right, brother? It's impulsive. Okay? We're impulsive buyers, okay? But we're impulsive in other areas, too, because what happens is sometimes when we get into a situation of being nervous or, or something like that, sometimes we just blurt things out. And then after we blurt it out, we're thinking, why did I say that? I should have said that. Or somebody says something to you and, and gets your dander up and, uh, and, and, and you respond in an unkind, unfriendly, uh, mean-spirited way, that's impulsiveness. And so we want to poke fingers at, at Peter and say, well, you know, Peter's that impulsive guy. He's always opened his mouth and starting foot. And I, and I dare say, if I took a poll this morning of how many of you have put your size 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 21 uh, in your mouth, we'd all have to raise our hand and say, guilty as charged. Okay. The thing about Peter was he was willing to say it whether, <laughs> whether you liked it or not. Okay? Now, some people call that being blunt. And sometimes blunt is just being uh, another kind of word of saying being mean. Okay? Uh, I know a person that uh, saw a lady. She came in with a, uh, with a new dress on, and the lady asked this person, said, how do you like my dress? She said, where did you get that god-awful thing? And, I, and, and, and somebody I knew, I said, well, why did you say that? Well, I was just being honest. I was just telling them what, you know. They asked me, I, I said, that's not always a nice thing to do. You know, of course, the lady got offended, and, you know, that, it, it shouldn't happen that way. But that's true. Okay, so we look at Peter's life, and we think, well, here, here's this impulsive guy. He, he, he's always saying things he shouldn't ought to say. He's always chiming in when nobody else. But, but you have to understand something. Of all the 12 apostles, Peter is the only one that ever spoke up. And as I said last week, when, when, when Jesus came to him and said, Hey, guys, let me ask you a question. Who, who, who do men say that I am? And they spoke up and said, Well, some say you're, you're Elijah. Some say you're you know, Jeremiah. Some might say you're Isaiah. Some say you're one of the other prophets. And then he said, But, hey, okay, that's what they think. Who do you say that I am? An impulsive loud mouth, size 10 foot in the mouth, Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, so when you, when you stop and you consider, Peter really speaks for all of us. Because all of us have this tendency in our lives to do things and say things and, and all. And so we can kind of see that. And yet, when you, when you look at Peter, and as we talked about last week, when it comes, comes down to the very final uh, uh, act of, of 
Peter, he's the one that stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached a phenomenal message. And 3,000 souls were saved. Very qualified. In Matthew chapter number 16, Jesus uh, tells Peter, he said, uh, your name's Peter. That means a little stone, a little rock. Sometimes I think, Brother Philip, it's, it's that like that little rock that gets in your shoe and annoys you until you get it out. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think about Peter in that in that in that vein. I sometimes I won't say that out loud. <clears throat> he says, "You're Peter. You're a little rock. You're a little stone." He said, "But upon this rock, I'll build my church." You're going to be instrumental in, in accomplishing that. And that's exactly what Peter did. He was very instrumental in getting the, the work of God started and, 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 and getting the gospel out, not just to uh, Jerusalem and Judea, but into Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. As we look in 1 Peter chapter number 1, what we need to look at, first of all, is verse number 1, because it comes first. Brilliant powers of deduction I have. But notice this. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the stranger scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, that word strangers there is an interesting word. We tell our kids, don't talk to strangers. What do we mean? Don't talk to somebody you don't know. Okay, sometimes we call uh, people who come from another country strangers because they're foreigners. They, they don't uh, belong in our country or they just moved to our country. And so we, we would call them strangers or foreigners. And then we have those that, you know, when, when you're thinking about, about strangers, you're thinking about those who have moved to a new area for various reasons. And they're living in a strange country. By the way, as Christians, we are strangers to this world, or ought to be strangers to this world. The songwriter said, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. <laughs> Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, he said, we are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of one country to another country. And as a child of God, as a Christian, you are a resident. Your, your residency, your, your, uh, uh, your native land is heaven. It ought to be. And now then, God has said, now that you are a child of God, you are my child, and now your residency is in heaven, you are to be an ambassador to this world. And so... In, in relationship to that, Paul or Peter is talking to uh, the, the churches uh, that are established there. And he says, now, to, I'm addressing this letters to the strangers that are scattered abroad. Now, who is he talking about? He's talking about the children of Israel, those, those Christians who have, have moved from Jerusalem now. They have moved to these different areas uh, of the country, of the, of the world, in order to have peace and Tranquility, yes, and we'll see that in just a moment, but in order also to propagate the gospel by God's design and God's plan. If you'll take your Bible, turn back to the book of Acts, chapter number 1. Acts, chapter number 1. Notice, if you will, in Acts, chapter number 1, and you know these things, I'm just kind of rehearsing them in your mind, just kind of help you here, but Jesus is talking, he's about to be ascended up into heaven, and they're asking him a question, are you going to come back, set this kingdom up and all that? He said, that's not your business, that's not something that you need to know about. He says, but, he says, I want you to understand, verse number 7, And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Rather than wondering when the rapture is fixed to take place, when the millennial kingdom is fixed to be set up, he said, God's got that under control. That's in his power. 
stop worrying about it. Stop focusing on that. Because that's not what's important. What is important? Verse number 8 is important. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The one thing of those who are standing in my audience right now Jesus is saying is getting the gospel to the world. That's your focus. That's your plan. Don't worry about all of these other... I mean, <laughs> I know people that they focus. I mean, I, I love prophecy. And when things are start coming about with 9-11 with and all these things, and, and then they write the book on the harbinger and all these... I mean, it's interesting information... But it detracts us from one important thing. Souls. The problem in most churches today is the fact that we're so focused on everything else. I hear people saying, oh, man, I can just hardly wait till the rapture takes place. I am ready to get out of here. Is there anybody that's not ready to get out of here? Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? I mean, <laughs> we're all ready to get out of here. We're all ready to, to, to vacate this world. We're ready to vacate the wickedness, and we're ready to vacate uh, all of our society because of the wickedness uh, that's pervading what's happening in our world today. We're all ready to go. <laughs> but, what about your neighbor? Interesting thing yesterday. We were out knocking doors in a certain area here in Baytown. And we're knocking on doors that Victory Baptist Church has already been on and put a door hanger on. And somebody even commented, hey, Victory Baptist Church has already been here already. <laughs> and that tells us that there's an urgency. If they're out knocking doors and we're out knocking doors, then there's an urgency to get the message out to a lost and dying world. You see, the problem is, we, I mean, some of us are so far in debt, we're just ready for the rapture to take place so that the, the, the world can just have our debt. Hello? Some of us are so sick and tired of working... And we're just ready for the rapture to take place so I can get a vacation. Honestly and truthfully, our focus is on self and selfishness and the things that are going to appeal to me. And Jesus says it's not a, a matter of when I'm coming back. It's not a matter of any of that. The important thing is getting the message of the gospel out. And if you look in chapter number 2, after these men of God... They went up into that upper room and prayed, 120 of them, and they prayed. And then on chapter 2 and verse number 1, the day of Pentecost was fully come. What happened? The Spirit of God came down. Notice, if you will, he says in verse number 2, until the day which he was, oh, I'm in chapter 1. <laughs> that didn't look right. As when the day of Pentecost, I'm going to, Chapter 2 starts with that verse, and I can't figure out why it's not there. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost was fully come, chapter 2, verse 1, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, that does not mean that they were driving a Honda. In one accord, in one place. Just thought I'd put that out there. Okay? They were in fellowship. They were in unity. They were in accord in one place. That doesn't speak to many churches nowadays. But notice what they were in, and verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of, uh, uh, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, 
and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the, uh, with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the miracle here is not that they spoke in a language they didn't understand. They spoke a language that was known in their area. 16, 18 different languages. They may not have learned it. Somebody asked me, I think Brother Philip asked me yesterday, do you speak Spanish? <laughs> Enough to get myself in trouble. Right, Luke? <laughs> Enough to get me in trouble. I'm not fluent in Spanish. But if I need to, I can, I can make myself understood in Spanish. Fluent in American Sign Language, fluent in English, those are languages that I do know. But God can use that language that I do know to speak to somebody whom I don't know. Because the Holy Spirit of God can help them hear the language in their own language. Very important to understand that. But come down. Very important. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Very important. Under, uh, if you have a Bible and you underline your Bible, I mean, my Bible looks like a road map. But under, underline that statement. There were Jews, devout men. Notice what he says. Dwelling in Jerusalem out of every nation under heaven. Verse 6, And now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they heard that every man heard them speak in his own language. It is not an ecstatic tongue. It wasn't that. They heard it in a language they understood. And he even gives that. Follow along. He says, um, verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? Where were they from? They were from Galilee. That's like saying, <laughs> for you to help, to help you understand, are that not all these people that are speaking Baytonians? Uh, they live right here with us. I've never heard them speak that language before. And he lists them. Verse number 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue, language, wherein we were born? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, and Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Isn't that amazing? They go on to say, well, these guys must be drunk. <laughs> that still doesn't make sense to me. They're speaking a language that's understood grammatically correct. Have you ever heard a drunk talk? <laughs> what? They, they don't speak a language anybody understands. Peter gets up and says, wait a minute, guys. These guys aren't drunk. And he preaches unto them Jesus. An interesting thing. And the reason I, I pull this out, because in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he says, to the stranger scattered throughout, and several of those areas, Pontus, Galatia, Asia, and Bithynia, are places where he's addressing this place. Isn't that amazing? It's important to understand that they heard the message. Now, these people, they, they were dwelling in Jerusalem. They were living in Jerusalem. How did they get over there to those back to those areas? 
Well, that's a good question. Because a lot of people were saved during that period of time. 3,000 souls on that day. If you continue to read the book of Acts, 5,000 were saved. Multitudes were saved. Yeah. There's a lot of people saved. So how did they get from there to, where, to their homelands? Well, if you'll turn to chapter number 8, we'll find out. A very clear principle in the truths of the Word of God because of the fact that what was it that Jesus said our most important job was to do? Get the message from where? We're going to preach it in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. Okay? The problem was that they were keeping it in Jerusalem. The message was staying in Jerusalem. They, they, they weren't going outside the borders of Jerusalem. They weren't even going out into, Jeru into Judea. I mean, what they were doing was they were keeping the gospel nested in Jerusalem. Oh, they're doing a great job. Hundreds of people, thousands of people are being saved. And man, that, that's, a, that's a great thing. When thousands of people are being saved, man, we're doing a great work here. But they had lost the focus. Because the, prop, the, the, the proper work of the church is not just to build our Jerusalem, it's to send from our Jerusalem into the uttermost parts of the earth. You see, that's why Brother Philip's here today. He's going to Pasadena, California to start a church. And you say, can somebody start a church in, in, in California? Absolutely. Brother Jack Lamb did it. He went to West Covina, California, a suburb of L.A., and, 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 and sat down at a church. And not only did he get a church started, hey, he even got a building for free. A massive building, a beautiful building. I'm excited about getting in my vehicle and going out there and seeing it. But we had a part in that. But you see, the problem, if, if we keep our money right here, and we say, well, all we're concerned about is the people that live in Baytown and Highland, we've lost the focus of what it is we're supposed to do. Now then, let's go to chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul, we also know him as, as Paul, was consenting unto the death, and all that time, was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Paul, or for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. There's an interesting statement. If you, if you underline in your Bible, circle in your Bible, highlight in your Bible, this would be a good place to do it. Notice what he says, And Saul was consenting unto, the, unto his death, speak, speaking of Stephen, and at that time there was a great, what? Persecution. Where was the persecution at? Against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Notice that, semicolon. The persecution was at the church at, at Jerusalem. Because of persecution, because of difficulty, because of problems, what happened? And they were all, what is that word? Scattered abroad. Throughout the regions of where? Judea, Samaria, So what God was doing through Saul of Tarsus was getting the people from Jerusalem where they were doing a great job to get them into the other parts of the earth. You see, we don't understand this concept. When we talk about door knocking, we talk about soul winning, and Brother Philip and I were talking about this yesterday. You know, soul winning is not about Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. It's a 24-7, 365 proposition. 
God wants us to, to be talking to people on a daily basis every single day. He wants us to propagate the gospel. He wants us to push the gospel out. He wants us to give the gospel so that God can use somebody in our Jerusalem and call them to go to some other area and do a work. I get phone calls all the time. I mean, it, it's almost a daily process that I get a call, phone call from a missionary. I talk to probably hundreds of missionaries a year. And they're all get, going to different places. Some are going to here in the United States. And, and there are some churches that say, well, the United States is not a mission field. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. A major mission field where churches were sending missionaries to other areas and to other countries and, and establishing churches. America now is receiving missionaries from other countries back in. You say, well, those are Muslims. No, 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 no. You're missing the point. They are coming in and they're infiltrating and they're deceiving the masses. But do you realize that there are Filipinos coming back to the United States and establishing churches? preach the gospel? Do you realize that there are, 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 are Indians coming from India, the United States, to work with their people as church planters to get the message out? Do you realize that there's preachers from Mexico coming? That's a sad commentary because <laughs> there's plenty of Hispanics here that could do that, but no, they're coming from Mexico into the United States. Well, they just want a, 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 a no. It's not because they want a better life. It's because they want to reach their people with the gospel of Christ. You see, that is the responsibility. And so in verse number one, Peter says, now I want you to understand something. I'm addressing this letter, this epistle, that I'm writing to you, to those of you who have been scattered because of the persecution and because of difficulties and because you feel that you have a call on your life to go into these other areas and preach the gospel, I'm writing it to you for, for three purposes. One, for surrender. You need to be surrendered to the work and will of God if you're going to do anything. A surrendered life. You have to be surrendered. And if you're more focused on the rapture than you are souls, then you're not surrendered. If you're more focused on getting, getting the rapture taking you out so you can get out of your job or out of your bills or, or whatever and get that beautiful mansion in heaven with, the, with, the, with the, the, uh, the awesome chef's kitchen with that big refrigerator that opens up and it's got uh, cherry pies on every shelf and, and promised land chocolate milk in the doors and, and bluebell uh, Dutch chocolate ice cream in the freezer. Now, that's just my mansion. I don't know what your mansion has in it. If that's your only focus... You're not surrendered. You see, it's about surrender. It's about service. Service. There's a God in heaven. He didn't save us to live down here and do nothing. He's called us. He's commissioned us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I go home and preach to my dog. <laughs> Every creature. That's a taking a little far, but if it helps me preach the gospel to somebody else. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm all for it. Service. Surrender. And service. And there's also going to be some suffering going along with it. You see, God has a desire to use his people to reach his people. And I'll be honest with you. Brother Philip can bear this out. You can ask him at, at his table after a while. Used to, our churches had missionaries come and surrendering and going to the field in their, in their early teens. There are some that actually surrendered back when they were five, six, seven years old. And they prepared themselves. And now 
they go to Bible college and they get their degree, and now they're saying, hey, I want to go too. I want to go here. I want to go there. I want to go do this. This is where I believe God wants me to go. Do you know what the average age of surrendering missionaries is today? Between 45 and 50. Is that right? You, have you noticed the missionaries that come through our church are older? They have older children. <laughs> when they first came in, they had little, precious little babies, precious little toddlers, <laughs> and we just love them. And now they're coming in with 16, 15, 11 year olds. Some of them, their kids are already gone off into college, and they're saying, "Hey, God's called us to go do." Isn't that amazing? You say, what's the difference, the focus of the church? The focus of the church. Because the focus of the church is tickling the air. Giving our youth what they want. Having their little lock-ins with, uh, with their video games and, and, and their movies and and, and, all, and, and not focusing on the Lord. Oh, we'll have a little devotion. We'll do a little object lesson. But it's all about play. It's all about... <laughs> Man, we had a great time at the Lafayette last night. But what did you do? Man, we played a tournament of video games like you wouldn't believe. Everybody brought theirs and... Man, we were had these, this virtual game going. And that's what the kids are doing at home. They're playing virtual games. They're, they're playing their friends in other houses. I mean, usually you had to be at least in the same house. Now you, have, you, you can be anywhere in the world and play them. It doesn't make sense to me, but it works. But see, that's the problem. We're not teaching our children the importance of ministry. The importance of surrendering to the Lord. Importance of, of, of submitting, surrendering, the importance of service. Or just teach, <laughs> well, you know, maybe one of these days they've got, you know, we don't really want our kids to be missionaries. We don't want our kids to be pastors. Because well, we've seen what pastors go through. Now, I won't say that. I was doing a Joel thing. I shouldn't have. <laughs> it just went right, right through my brain. Honestly and truthfully, we as parents aren't focused on the right thing as far as our kids are concerned. That's a sad commentary. And then we wonder why the church is going through so much persecution and trials and tests. It's because God's saying, hey, let's get things moving. Let's get things going. Let's get the gospel out. Let's, let's see what we can do to get. Because I'm coming back. You don't know the day nor the hour. But do you have family members that are unsaved? I sure do. Led my 92 year old grandma to the Lord. <laughs> Seventh day at Venice. Just opening the Bible. Just going through it with her. Verse after verse. This is what the Bible says now. She bowed her head and trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for life. Lived to be 100 had the opportunity of taking my Bible, my granddad in the hospital. My uncle called me, he said, he said, he said, Jimmy, my family calls me Jimmy. You need to come to Mississippi right now. Dad's about to die. 
He needs to hear the gospel. And you say, well, why didn't he give the gospel? He did. He wouldn't listen to it. In fact, in January I was there, he wouldn't listen to me. And I didn't know if he'd listen to me in February when he was in the hospital about to die. I went to that ICU, and just he and I, and I said, I thought, you know, Doctors say you don't have long to live. Yeah, son, I know. How far if you were to die, would you go to heaven? No. Can I show you in the Bible how you can go to heaven? How far? I want to see you again. And I went to the Bible. My papa was 78 years old. Bowed his head in that ICU bed. Trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. see, I'm going to see my mama again. I'm going to see my papa again. I'm going to see family members again. My wife. And all those that I've sent on before me. There's a whole group of people behind me that don't. Philip Kinsey, boys will tell you, we went to eat Mexican food yesterday. What happened, brother? How many people came up and talked to you? Good to see. Even the, even the owner. He didn't see his wife speak to me as I was looking through Are they saved? Yeah. Are they going to get saved? <laughs> I'm praying for them. And that's just one restaurant. I didn't get this way by fasting. And that's multiplied over and over and over again. Because there has to be a desire in somebody's heart to reach somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can pull a Moses. Well, I'm not eloquent. That means I ain't good at speaking. For those southerners who ain't know what that means. I ain't got no learning. You find John 3.16 in your Bible and have a testimony. See, one of these days we're going to stand as a chorus around the white throne judgment. The people that we have known are going to be down there being condemned to hell for eternity. In my mind's eye, I can see them pointing their bony finger at me and saying, You never told me. You never told me. You never. Who do you need to tell? They won't listen. That's a cop out. That's a cop out. They will listen. When they know you care. When they know that Brother Gary was talking about you're not living in a lot of pride. You're humble for them. Well, they have their names for you. Holy Ghost. Fanatic. But once they find Jesus, those things don't matter. You see, we can use all kinds of excuses for not doing what God's asked us to do. What Peter's doing here, he's saying, look, we stuck ourselves in Jerusalem for a long time. But now you're in Bithynia, you're in Cappadocia. Here's what you need to do. Here's where you need to go. You need to keep the message going. That's what we need to do too. 
This isn't a message about AD 70. It's a message about March 6th of 2016. Very, very clear, very plain. We have a responsibility to the Lord. May we stand for prayer. Father, we thank you today for your blessings. We thank you, Father, for the truth of the Word of God. Lord, I am so concerned about our city, surrounding areas. I believe it was last March, maybe it was March two years ago, we started at Interstate 10, 2100 in Highlands. We knocked on every door as far as we knew. Gave out gospel tracts. Came up into Baytown. Now we're working on the south side of Baytown. Lord, we haven't done enough. Get the gospel out. Lord, we're more concerned about our financial situation at home than we are about getting people to hear the gospel other parts of the country. Or this wasn't a mission-minded message, but yet it turned to be a mission-minded message because it's so true. The most important thing in you and your heart is the souls of men. And I've always said and always preached that when you become a missionary, I've seen churches die because they've had missionaries. I hate a preacher. Lord, I'd rather be in a soup line standing in the street corner begging for food than to see our church die. To see a missionary not go somewhere and lead somebody Christ. Lord, I pray that the heart of missions would be the heart of the Garth Road Baptist Church. Work in our heart. Father, there may be somebody here this morning if they were to die right now. They don't know we're ever sure for a final reason. They have a home in heaven. Lord, I pray they come to know Our heads bowed, our eyes closed. We're looking around. It's time for the invitation. The invitation is ready for you to respond. You respond to the invitation because God has spoken to your heart in some way.